Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lisa DeMauro, and I am joined by my husband, Chris DeMauro, and we are the Talking Gravesend podcast, the podcast that is dedicated to celebrating William DeMeo's streaming series, Gravesend. Today, we have a very exciting guest here in the studio. We are joined by the creator of the Gravesend series, William DeMeo. That's right, Lisa. William's not just the creator of Gravesend. He's an accomplished writer, actor, producer, and director. He's got a long list of film credits from Wannabes, uh, Once Upon a Time in Brooklyn. He's even been in a few episodes of, of The Sopranos. We couldn't be more excited to have William here. William, welcome to the welcome show. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. And Brooklyn's in the house here in Springfield, Massachusetts, which is a great, great place here. I am, oh, wow, I've never been to Springfield. I've been t to Boston and the North End, of course, with my good friends in the North End. But uh, I love uh, Springfield here. It's a, it's a great, great place. And um, the architecture, the old buildings, uh, and your setup here is wonderful. I mean, I mean these windows here... These windows, uh, it, it's great, like, how people could come around and just, like, see what we're doing here. It, it, it's You guys have a great setup here, and I'm honored and thrilled to be here. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. We like to call this little box, it's the Italian Today Show. <laughs> we have a lot of, you know, we hope one day to see folks out back with the Gravesend signs, cheering you know, us on. Get some signs It's going. happening. It's happening. We have a lot of fun, William. Your show was like a beacon of hope to us. You know, um, growing up the way that I grew up as a young Italian-American boy, I'm 52 years old, and your show being set in the late 80s with the music, the cars, the styles, and quite frankly, all of the rules and tempos. It was just, it's just so much fun to watch. And that's why we dove into the Talking Great and podcast, quite frankly, because we were so inspired by the show. Thank you. I feel like that God has been behind this show and, and, and lifted us up to be able to complete yes. and be able to get to where we are now and meet great people like you and your beautiful wife here, Lisa. Uh, what you did is also extremely uh, courageous and you took the bull by the horns and decided to, and, and that's why I'm, I'm grateful. And because my whole life, I've really never let anything stop me from getting to where I needed to be and, and, and um, never giving up uh, to, to when the doors close, you just try to find an open door. Uh, and you took it up, you guys took it upon yourselves to, find uh look at our show and 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 make a, a podcast talking gravesend kind of like how they did talking sopranos which was done so well from uh, my, my friends um uh, michael imperioli and steve sharippa and you came up with your own version of talking gravesend and and you got our attention and that's why i'm here uh a lot of people have uh, sent us things and, and, and you, you know, um, done stuff uh, to, to try to get the attention of, of not always positive, sometimes negative, which, which is unfortunate, but you took something and, and you sent a positive message and you, you, you really depict this story very well. And I, I'm, 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 I'm honored to be here and I, and I want you to know that I'm really grateful that you guys did this and you you analyzed our show and you know no matter how big or no matter what happens i would i would come here no matter what because i i see effort and and people that are good people that are that are putting a positive message for our show and and i'm thrilled to be in springfield massachusetts today we are so excited to have you here. We want to jump. We have a ton of questions to ask you. I know you're a busy guy and you have a lot of time on uh, a lot of things that you have to get to. Um, let's talk a little bit about you in the very beginning. You know, so are you really from Brooklyn? Oh, of course, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I grew up in, in Gravesend. Uh, uh, I was born in Bensonhurst, which is right next to Gravesend. And, uh, you know, when you, in Brooklyn, like, Bensonhurst kind of always overshadowed uh, Gravesend. It was more like people knew Bensonhurst than Gravesend. Sure. And the thing is, is that uh, I'm so proud that so many people from Gravesend now, uh, we really have made Gravesend very well known. Uh, and, and 
so many times people come up to me and say, Will, uh, you really put our our neighborhood on the map. Uh, and, you know. I never a, heard of it until your show. Yeah. I, I mean, never heard of it. And it was just a great place to grow up. And I'm so proud of of growing up there. And I, I just wanted to tell a story about what it was like that in that time period to grow up in, in such a unique way that we that we did and it was I wouldn't change it for anything and I, you know there's a scene in the show when Benny says they're sitting on the stoop my character Benny and he's talking to Mikey and he says uh you know Caesar could keep his mansion in uh in um Long Island that we 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 have the heartbeat of the city right here it's the center of the universe yes uh so Growing up the way we did, uh, I wouldn't change it. You know, me and me and my brother shared a room uh, growing up in, in in Brooklyn, but I wouldn't change it for anything because I just remember, like, as a kid that uh, I would hear, like, one of my friends, one of my dear friends, um, my, my buddy John, who lived a, a few, John Apolito, he lived a few doors down from me. I would hear the creak of his, his bike made, like, a certain noise, and I would go to the window, and I would see him, and then I would say, Mom, I'm going out now. And, like, what we had on my block as a kid just was, like, we, we had, like, it was just insane that we did everything. We played ball all night. We hung out. We played manhunt. We played red light, green light. We played in the streets. And and it was, like, all, day, all for hours, Riding the big wheel up and down the block, <laughs> um, those days are just like so amazing because the world changed so much that like it just changed drastically in like the early two thousands. Like it just sure. completely like if you look at the, all these decades from the fifties all the way up to the nineties, they it, things changed and we evolved, but we really hit like when the internet and social media just totally pulled everything in a different direction. And, um, I feel like the eighties was kind of like the last part of those really good days. And, um, like I said, it, it was just a wonderful way to grow up. And, and I feel for the, the younger generation because they'll never know really how great those days were. Like, we knew what those days were from the 50s because it was similar. Even though it was different, it was still similar. Their world is completely different. Sure, kids today don't uh, pop the fire hydrant. They go to the splash parks. You know, <laughs> that's a huge difference. Yeah. When you were young, um, you, you mentioned that uh, you shared a room with your brother. What did your parents do for a living? Uh, well, my, my father worked for the tr Transit Authority, um, and my mother was just a, a, ho a housewife. And, and um, you so know, you're not an industry person. You didn't really come from I, this industry at all. I, I didn't know anyone at all in this business. Um, uh, you know, and it was just to be part of a Bronx Tale as my first, uh, my first job. Uh, not even being an actor and just getting the opportunity to 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 be on a set with Robert De Niro directing me. And, uh, you know, Chaz Palminteri had got his break, too. Uh, it was just um, just amazing to start in, a, when, in one of the greatest movies. And, and if you oh, look no at question. mob movies, I always put Bronx Tale, like, up there in the top three, in my opinion, 100%. You're 100% correct. Bronx Tale gets it right. Um, Sonny's character is just outstanding. You know, my favorite scene is when he drives in reverse through the neighborhood because they're always right, right? A wise guy's always right. He always knows what to do. And that scene would just seems so authentic to me. Uh, that and the test. You remember the test. test? Yeah, of course. Hey, did you put the test in uh, the scene with you and uh, oh, with you in Virginia? and you in Virginia when you yeah. came out of the, when you came out of the when you came out of the Vegas diner and before the, you went back before in you for went your back beeper in before you got your beeper, I noticed it, Virginia. She, lean, she leans, leans over, over and opened it. Did you write that did, in there? No, no, she did it on her own. Come All on. Right, that was just improv. Nice. That was, that was, that was, there was nothing written in there for the girl to do that. She just did it because she was in character and that's what the girl Virginia would do. Oh, and, and straight up, that was not in the script. Okay. She just lifted up the button and it, and it was great. 
because you know back then you know you did lift the button, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Or you hit the power lock, you know what I'm saying? It's different now. You just press the button and the doors open up. So, um, and that was a great um, line, and um, th- 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 which when Chaz Palminteri wrote that door test, yeah, like you said, that was uh, the test great, is what matters. Yeah, he you know said what the I mean? test, the test yeah. is what matters. Fuck everything else. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> Part of my yeah, life. It's, it's 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 amazing. Yes, absolutely. So I saw that. I mean, you you and I are on the same age. So I got to ask you: Did did you break dance when you were a kid? Oh, I loved breakdance. I was great breakdance. I think I saw a video of you I doing was, some footwork. I was, I was, I could still rock it. I could still. I know you down. can. So, what was your breakdance name? Um, well, they called me Willie Windmill. I used Willie to Windmill. Willie <laughs> Windmill. I love you it. Do, you could do Amtrak's Ball Busters, all that. I, I could do. I, I, I guess you. I don't know what Amtrak. What is that? Windmill with your arms out. Oh no! I did windmills. I did. I used to do them. I used to do Tuck them in. like this. Okay. I never did them off my head. Even. Okay. I don't know how some people did them off their head. That was crazy. But just the the, the basic windmill, I I I I moved it like you know yeah. what I'm saying. And and I I was great at the hand glide. Okay. Uh, my hand my hand glide. I could go boom 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 boom. I could keep going nice. with the hand. I could do the hopping hand glide, uh, footwork. Was was great. It was it was fun because we we used to battle with uh, you know we we're from like Avenue U and we would battle with you know kids from Bay Parkway and Avenue X and all the different kids would like battle and that's what was so fun about those days like you know you you know you guys like we did we played wiffle ball against other blocks we played stick ball against other blocks we played two hand touch against other blocks it was so much fun it was so cool it was so great like you know now kids they hardly even talk to each other yeah. like everything's this everything's the phone everything's texting everything is like it's just a different world um and and i wouldn't change it for anything yeah, we're lucky. Our, we live in a little neighborhood, and our daughter, Luciana, she rides her bike with her friends. She does regular stuff, goes out in the woods and builds forts. Uh, they play, you know, flashlight tag at night. I mean, just regular old stuff. We're blessed to have. We, our daughter's like 12, and she's like going on nine. She's a, she, she's a mama Del, You know that term. And I love the name, Luciana. That's beautiful. I'm sure she's very beautiful as well. That's great. You guys are a, a beautiful couple, and uh, that's great that you're, 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 your kid is still like – you're teaching them the old school ways. Yes. Yes. So she, she comes over here and we put her to work over at Palazzo with Luisa. We say, go over there, start start wiping down tables. Uh, she's a regular little Italian girl. She, I she's, mean, she's more tech savvy than probably all of yeah, us combined she, <laughs> in the room. She's a little editor, content creator herself, but she definitely, she, she likes to crochet and she has that old, old world awesome. bit to her. That's so great. it's fun. It's That's fun. Great. So do you have, did you, before, I'm going to start jumping a little bit more into the modern times, but I just want to ask one more question about your youth, William. And was there ever like a movie or a show that you used to watch that would make you feel good when you felt bad? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I loved Saturday Night Fever. Okay. Saturday Night Fever was, and that's why I put um, touches of it in Gravesend. It was that, a, that, that movie to me was like, into, but just not me, it was like my whole neighborhood. We, cause we, you know, if you really think about that time, like you had John Travolta playing this character, Tony Monero, and with the white suit on and dancing and being from Brooklyn and, and, and all the women wanted him and just the way he was and, and just that, that swag he had. So we're in Brooklyn, right? So we're guys, we live in Brooklyn. So we're like, you know, he's playing what we are. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like they, 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 his character was. Based you felt that was representative that, of right? you felt his, at his, home. his character was based on guys like you know I was young, but guys like my like my friends that were older and and family that was older. It was like it was the nightlife and the clubs in Brooklyn. Um, so that movie to me was just because I'm from Brooklyn, and here I got this guy who was the biggest star at the time. He became that movie made him like a huge star. The movie, the music, the, music. the Bee Gees, yeah. like all of that music and everything. So that movie would always make me feel, you know, and just at the dinner table because our family was kind of the similar with the dinner table, everything that went on, and just. Um, but he was so. Like he just the way he moved on the dance floor and and just how cool he was, yeah. um, and just w- with his friends, just like how they you know they bonded for the most part, because uh, so that's what I I felt like growing up. Like I still have the same friends that I grew up with, like and that's why sometimes I see like people like um, I'm so blessed because the the people that I like as a as a 
kid growing up, like I'm still friends with like 95, like we're still tight. And those are the people that I trust the most in the world are people that I, I broke bread with as a kid. Yeah. And like, we, there's a thing about us and this is why, like, as I got, um, you know, more famous through the years, like my friends, like the people that I grew up with, they, they're so proud of me because I've taken how we grew up and put it on the screen in a way. Uh, and just, um, they like, we're, we're so tight that it, it doesn't matter. They don't look at me like, um, I'm an actor. Like yeah, they don't look sure, at me. Sure. You're like still I'm the in, same friend that's been on like, the block. Like, still Willie windmill. Yeah. Like they don't look at me like that. And like the, the thing that makes me so happy too, is that I've given them, a lot of my friends I grew up with, like, have met some very big celebrities through the years, and 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 been had had the opportunity to experience like a bit of Hollywood through sure. me. Uh, and that's what I also love about everything. As as I say, is that the part that makes me the most happy and proud is the fact that we're doing something that we can give people, like young kids and people on the streets, like. Um, because I remember what I, when I did a Bronx Tale, and it was my first part, and um, I'm like a young guy, and I'm and I'm on this set, and uh, and it's all like the props and everything. I felt like I was in the '60s, and I I was so thrilled to be to be there and experiencing something that was for me mesmerizing, and I kind of feel like when you come to our set on Gravesend. And there's all these kids in the street and they're by the fire hydrants and they're the Johnny Pump, as we call it. And they're there the and, they're, and they're playing in the streets and stuff like that. And these kids are there and they're having a great time and they're experiencing something that they'll remember for the rest of their lives. And uh, it makes me very happy and, and thrilled that we can give people that opportunity. Um, and I love the fact that um, I'm working with such great talent and and we're having a lot of fun and it's just it's it, it's a blessing from god that's all i'll say your show has you just said it great talent you have a cast of characters um frankly uh Gaetano's character, Chris Marmando, his character spoke, his speaks to me. You know what I mean? He has just such a way about him and he's going through such turmoil in the show. Peter uh, Gaudio, you met him on the Bronx Tale. Is that true? Yes. Uh, yeah. Peter, Peter. So, um, what happened when we were doing a Bronx Tale is that, uh, we were supposed to just be, you know, be stickball kids. There was a whole bunch of group of kids for, uh, on the street and, um, Robert De Niro, um, asked that a whole group of people line up on the against the wall. It was about um, 30 of us. And um, I didn't know Peter at the time. And uh, De Niro, Robert De Niro came over and he and he picked three people out. And I was one of them. Peter was one of them. And my friend Lenny, who I grew up with, was another one. And we winded up getting like that scene when the girls pull up with the convertible. Yes. And we're talking to them on the corner. Kind of catcalling them. Yeah, yeah, and it was um, with the being directed by Robert De Niro, so that was like a, a, and Peter and I have been friends since that. We we've been friends since that, and and getting to you know, and he's a great, and he does such a great job. You know, you know when he's showing up on on in a scene that there's going to be trouble. He has that presence. Yes, yes that heavy. And, uh, yeah, we've worked in other movies together too, but Peter's Peter has a heart of gold. Um, he's a he's really a a good friend. And uh, a very talented guy and, and, and a bodybuilder who, who, like, let me tell you something about that guy. Like, he brings food to the set. He brings his own food, his grilled chicken, his, his sweet potatoes. Okay. The guy has the most, um, he's so disciplined. And I always tell him that. And, and to Chris Marmando, Chris Marmando is, is not just a great actor. He's a really good person. He's someone that, like... Um, is great to be around because when Chris Momando sh- walks into a room, he comes with complete positivity. Yeah. He walks into a room and he lights up the room because he's like, Gaetano's here. We're here with this. Everything yeah. is positive. Everything is is good. He's always he's always speaking good about people and, and brings um something to the set that we love because he he's he's just that's his charisma that he has. 
And um, the character that he plays, he plays it so well because he's really torn um, with, with what's going on. And wait till you see what happens in season three with his character. It's beyond insanity. I can only imagine. It's beyond insanity. That scene with uh, Gaetano and Agent Murano in that red interior was a li- Mercury Grand Marquis, maybe? Yeah, it was a Mercury Grand Marquis. Okay, I exactly. thought so. And, and, I mean, that scene was... And it was really great great job on shooting it, right? Like, every scene from Agent Murano is, like, handheld. And you can see his breath, and you can see and feel really everything. feel the emotion. And every other scene on Gaetano's locked off. You know what I mean? And it was just a really well-done scene, and it really drew me in, and I realized this this, this story was taking a serious turn after uh, mm-hmm. that, that exchange. Let me tell you guys... Tell um, you both and, and the audience here, you guys have no cl- idea what's gonna happen. Like you, you. Uh, let me just. Uh, it's gonna be in insanity. <laughs> when, when you look back at this podcast here, when this, when the, when the f- season three finishes, you're gonna have you're gonna be blown utterly. And you're never going to be able to figure it out, so don't even try. Oh, I was going to say, I can't wait to begin to speculate what's going to happen. What goes down with Gaetano. So I'm really? Say. Oh, man. Oh, now you've boy. got us intrigued, William. Yeah, we can't oh, wait to see what happens with those baby blues. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yes. We love Gaetano's yeah, baby yeah, blues. Yeah, he, he's, he's uh, like I said, and he's from Brooklyn, too, and... Uh, He's you know, been through some hard things. Not to interrupt you, but I mean, this guy, he could he could not be as positive as you say, right? He walks into a room, he lights everybody up because he gives of himself, right? That type of energy is infectious. And and he it seems like, I've never met him, but only uh, through chatting on the phone, it seems like he is that type of person. And I know, he, like you said, he served time. He's been through a lot of things in his life, but yet he still brings that dream mentality right here yeah. every day. Well, well, a lot of people don't know this, um, and, and, I, and I'm going to say it. But the, um, first time I met Chris Mamando was um, I was in a, a casino. I have a house in the Poconos, and there's a casino not far from me. It's called Mount Airy Casino. And... Uh, and um, and there was this nightclub there. And this is going back about probably 12, 13 years. And uh, I'm walking through the nightclub, and he's there. And he's like, oh, Al Pacino from, from Analyze That. And, um, you he know. He just called you out. Yeah. And, and, he said, and he said my line. And, and we just started talking. And, and ever since then, uh, <laughs> we, we've been friends. But I, I got to tell you something, because... Chris uh, is, an, is, 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 you know, started acting later in the game. He did some time, like he said. Um, he made some mistakes. Uh, he turned his life around. He's, he's doing great. Uh, but um, I knew that he could handle a role of this caliber. I knew he could show sides to him. I, I seen it in him, and I knew that he was a very diverse actor. And even though there wasn't a lot of tape on him because he's a newer actor and sure. there's not much to look at, but he there will be a lot to look at in his future um, because he, I just knew that, number one, he knew the street. He grew up in the street. He's from Brooklyn. I knew I didn't have to worry about that part, but he could act. You see, a lot of times when, um, you know, people come up to me all the time, and say, you know, I'm from the street, I'm Brooklyn, I'm this, I'm, you know, the Bronx, I, you know, and, and they've did time where they've, they, they have back, but like, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can act, um, and I'm not trying to, I'm just saying is, is that Chris, I knew he took acting seriously. Yeah. There's a difference in being, you know, growing up in the street and all that, and then actually taking your craft and taking classes and, and studying to be an actor. Um, that is what Chris did. Chris Chris doesn't go in anything um, half-ass. So he fully 
um, dedicated to becoming an actor, and we're thrilled to have him in Graves, and he's a great guy. And, and yes. Chris Boy, come on, this guy. Kudos to you, Chris Boy. <laughs> I really like Chris in in all of his scenes, and Lisa always picks up on his micro expressions, especially when like when you shunned him, and and, and you were at the uh, the yacht club, you were sitting down with Tommaso for the first time in season two, catching up with the Jimmy Bean story, and Gaetano starts walking up, and you say, "I'll be right with you, Gaetano." Oh yeah, and just for him, the the disappointment that he expressed on his face for just a millisecond, it was it was perfect though I said oh god he was just slighted this is not yeah. good and that for me I was like that's when it all went downhill that's when it, he changed his mind but yeah he, he's really good I feel like he's like studied the the facial encoding system so he knows like all those micro expressions and all the Lisa, things to Lisa look has, for Lisa studied all the facial encoding yeah. systems yeah <laughs> gotta know those things absolutely <laughs> so as a filmmaker I'm just wondering you know y- Something that I love about your show is that nothing is left for, for like, a chance, right? Um, the song that's playing on the way when you're going to meet somebody, that has a meaning into uh, foreshadowing of what you're going to do. Um, nothing is left by chance. And, and as a filmmaker, I can tell that you're a perfectionist, right? You want everything to be a certain way because it's your vision from the very beginning. Now that you kind of went from season one, that first four episodes, and into season two, do you ever look back on any of your old work with a critical eye and, and just, like, kind of beat yourself up? Or, or look at it where I wish I could have done it a little bit differently? Or do you just move forward with, with your vision? Uh, that, that's a very good question. I mean, through, through you're talking about for Graves and you're talking about for all of any, my work. Any of your work, any of your work on film that you've put, whether it's Once Upon a Time in Brooklyn or Wannabes. Well, well before um, the success of Graves and, uh, I would look back at things sometimes and I would be, um, I feel like, when we fail, we get better. Yes. Um, and it's not a problem to fail. Um, if you pick yourself up and you your failures could bring you to succeeding. Uh, I was always um, was always very critical about things that I'd done, and I always I, I always had um, I was I was always it was uh, it was never easy, so I was always in situations where. Um, even when we were making our own movies that we were always limited on funding and stuff like that. And we, uh, you know, we, there was very little, um, margin for error. And, uh, there was things I looked back at that I wish it sometimes could have been different, but I realized that, you know, it was for a reason, but what I'm trying to get across here is that when, when you do things and sometimes, they're not exactly the way they should be. You you learn from it and you try to to so so my past, all my past movies and everything that I've done, I'm grateful that I was able to do it, and I'm proud of everything that I've done. Good. Every single movie, every one that I've worked with, I'm proud of everything that I've done. Of I've had a great, I've met wonderful people. I've had nothing but great experiences. I've worked with people that are no longer here anymore, you know, from Joe Vitarelli, who played um, in, in, in Wannabes with me, um, who told me when I went for the audition for Analyze That, because, okay. you know, that's Jelly, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. And um, I, I was, he did Analyze This, and it was so successful. And um, now we're getting into Analyze That, and I was reading for one of the roles, and um, we, had, we had did Wannabes already, and he had said to me, um, you know, it was my callback, and I was meeting Harold Ramis, wow. who is a um, wonderful, brilliant director. One of our favorites. The best, and he's no longer with us as well. And um, on my callback, he said to me, um, you're walking into Yankee Stadium, um, knock him dead, kid. This is a big thing for you, and it was Warner Brothers. Wow. And um, I- I'll never forget that. So um, I've had such great experiences, um, and uh, I... I- you know, all of us actors, like, we, we, we beat ourselves up all the time. We're in such a scrutinized business. We, um, we're all, we, we, we go through a lot, so much. We go through us actors and filmmakers to try to get noticed and try to get recognition. And, and I think that the success of Gravesend has made me realize that I always had the confidence and I never let any of the negativity that I just talked about ever get into my head, ever. Like you just said, because it would, I never, because I've been, we all are, if you're 
you're, you're doing something, you're always going to get people that try to knock you down, unfortunately, and they, they try to find things to try. To, and that's why I feel so much for young kids these days. It's kind of really sad what goes on in a way because you got these kids that are trying to do something, you know, sing a song or perform or dance. And then you got all these bullies and stuff that are just like, sure. like pulling on you. And it's so different with the internet. And, and, it, it, and I think that it discourages people. We have to realize that if you put yourself out there and you're going to put something there, you're going to have people that 100% are going to critique it. And, and the sad thing is, is that people want to see you fail. That's not really crazy. Absolutely. Yeah. Like even this podcast that you guys took the, you guys took, you know, the kudos and, and you guys did this, right? And you're here and we're here. So you succeeded because you set out to do something called Talking Gravesend on your own. And I'm here right now. Manifested so what it, it. Yeah. So, so it happened. And I think that, that, um, you have to just, when you, when you take a swing at a bat and you step up to the plate, you're going to, you're, you're subject to people criticizing you and it's part of, it's part of it. So I understand it now. Right now I'm in a place where, to be honest with you, I just want to continue doing what I'm doing. I don't let any of that. Good. I don't even think about that. You know, it's just, I'm, I'm way past all that right now. Uh, um, I'm blessed. I work with great people. Um, I love the fact that actors that I looked up to growing up are in my show yes. now. I love the fact that I'm giving people an opportunity that that at one point were like big stars. And as we all get older, sometimes anyone, when you get older, it's hard to maintain that. And these guys are phenomenal. And, and I'm working with them. Yes. And, and, and you know, we're all not going to be here one day. And um, I, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate being on working with someone like a Tony Darrow. Yeah. Right? A guy who I've been friends with for so many years. And here he is on my set and we're working together and, and I'm growing and, and, and these people now, um, like I said, that are older than me that have been through it all. Um, and they tell their stories and, and here they are on my set and taking direction for me and we're talking, you know, Chaz Palminteri uh, on Armand Asante and Andrew Dice Clay or William Forsythe. These guys are brilliant. Unbelievable. And, and I learned a lot from them. And now they're working with me. And, and this is all, you know, I, I think that when, when, I don't know why, like, what we're doing is we, we're, 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 the odds have been against us the whole time. Making our own show um, on, on such a tight schedule and tight budget. And I, I just really feel like that, that, that God has lifted us up. And brought us to this place. That's how I feel about it, and I'll never deny that. And I'm proud of it. And um, you know, I'm, I'm talking a lot about this right now. <laughs> Don't worry right. about it, Lisa. You want to jump in with questions? Yeah. Do you want to? Uh, we have some very specific questions um, about things that happened in the Gravesend series that were just unanswered questions for us, being uh, being super fans. Um, one of the first questions we have comes from uh, episode the first episode. Yes. And it's when everyone is sitting on uh, Mikey the Hat, Gino, they're sitting around the table. You just came from you just came from Our Lady of Grace Church with Tommaso. Yes. Now, and then what what was the drink you were drinking on the table? There's a brown drink in glass bottles, which is before plastic. And you've got the label turned around off camera so we can't Manhattan see. Special. Manhattan special. Manhattan what the hell is Manhattan special? special? I've never what heard of Manhattan that. Special. Wow, you guys don't know Manhattan special. No, no what is that? Oh god. Was it like a moxie? Manhattan Special is that's you know it was created in Brooklyn too. It's you, you, now you guys are going to have a Manhattan Special. So Manhattan Special is a is like a carbonated coffee, and it was okay. Like every, and people still drink them, but they were like back then that was like a very popular drink. And people, like I said, people that's old that's old school, right? Guys? Okay, wow. yeah. carbonated coffee. I didn't know what it was. I'm like, what do you think they're drinking, honey? I think they're drinking Moxie. Is it a cola? So I'm so happy. So it's Manhattan Special, and that's a caffeinated, like a it's coffee like a, soda. Yes, yes, sir. 
Oh, that's fantastic. And these, so you're eating heroes, right? This is what you call them down in Brooklyn? Yes. Now, I don't know if you know, here in Massachusetts, we call them grinders. Anything north of New Haven, a long sandwich isn't a sub, a hoagie, or a hero. It's a grinder. It's a grinder. I, I didn't, you know, I never knew that. Yeah. I, I I know that they some people call them hoagies, um, but I never heard of grinder. So, yeah, you'll yeah, see grinder Brooklyn, shots. In Brooklyn, they're heroes. If, they're heroes. If you watch our intro to the Talking Graves and podcast, we actually played paid homage to the Lords of Brooklyn song, We Come From Brooklyn. My cousin Nick Z from Fermata Face Studios uh, composed We Come From Springfield. So you hear that song. I love and, it. and we went and we watched how you had L&B Gardens and you had the church. And we tried to recreate that in this very Springfield style. And we had to put Antonio's grinders up on our intro just to like make a point. So the term grinders comes from the Groton Sun Boys. Uh, down in Groton, Connecticut, when the submarines were being made, uh, the men and women who used to work on the subs, uh, they would actually be grinding the rivets on the side of the sub, and they wanted a sandwich they could eat in one hand while they grinded on the other. And it was mostly Greek Americans who came up with that term. So that's how we, in this area, regional uh, sandwiches are called grinders. We laugh every time we hear hoagie, by the way. Wow. Well, or, well, yeah, or hero. Hero, yeah. Now, do these, do these heroes, now, I, I took a look. You guys put Buffalo Mozzarella right in the center of the hero? So it's it's fresh mutts, yeah. Fresh no mutts, kidding. Yeah, yeah, fresh mutts. Um, you know that those those heroes came from John's Deli. Which I want to eat one which of these. Is, which is an amazing deli in Brooklyn. Yeah, I mean those those heroes are the goods. Yeah. And you um, like the roast beef special? Right? The roast beef special in in um, John's Deli is unbelievable. That's the thing about Brooklyn. There's so many, and we shoot in a lot of them. There's so many great places for food, all different types. We um, want to come. <laughs> yeah. We want to come and eat There's this. So L and B Gardens, and, we're, and we're, well, yeah, L and B Spumoni Gardens. Um, that's a a great pizza place and heroes and and a restaurant. Um, that that place is in a lot of scenes. I go there all the time. I grew up on that pizza. I love those guys. They're very they're they're so Lenny, my my buddy Lenny, the owner of um, one of the owners there is a dear friend of mine. He's always supported me. I remember when I was making movies when I first started. He would send me, you know, pasta and, and, you know, he would send me things. He wouldn't charge me. He would send stuff, feed the feed the, the, the crew and the cast. I don't forget things like that. You did a great job showcasing L&B Spumani Gardens, the pizza. Uh, there's that scene when um, I think the girls, uh, Gabriella Pomateri's uh, character is out and they're getting pizza and Johnny Mad Dog is there. And before that happens, it shows L&B and they cut that big grandma on the, the sauce hits the plate. It sizzles oh, yeah, all that, off. That, that I mean, pizza looked real. That the looked pizza, fabulous. I want to eat yeah. that. You know, Lisa and I have a pizza show here in Massachusetts on TV. We actually do pizza. We had the mayor of Springfield, the Honorable Mayor Sarno, in the studio on Friday eating like five different pizzas from all over Springfield. We well, love pizza. We're big pizza fans. We're big pizza fans. Well, well, guys, you know, it's it's like a known fact that like New York, I'm not taking anything, oh, away. Here we go. Not taking here anything we go. away from Springfield, but let me just tell you, the beauty of this is that the beauty of growing up in Brooklyn, like I say, and that's why, you know, there's some good places when I go to Florida in the winter for a little while. When I go to L.A., I mean, there's there's a handful of places, like, here and there, like, scattered. Like, the beauty of growing up in Brooklyn is there's so, like, there's at least a dozen, like, really good places. Like, like, and they're all different. They're all great, but they're all different. You know, if you want to do brick oven, you know, some, some of the Sicilian or some of the Nablidan pizza is, like, just, it's so good. There's so many great places, and that's why... For people that, you know, a lot of times I'll post something because a lot of people have left Brooklyn, you know, through the years and, and they, you know, will go to a bakery called Villa Bate on 18th Avenue, which is okay. to me the best bakery in, 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 the, in the country. And, and I'll, I'll take a video and I'll show this. And, you know, a lot of times people left New York and, and the thing that they miss the most is always the food. Because you can't get that. And yeah. the good thing about growing up, like the way we did in Brooklyn, is like in the middle of the night, there's a diner open, great Greek diners. You know, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, you want to get a cheeseburger deluxe, you know, with disco fries, with the, with the, with the gravy um, on the fries. Um, you got the bagel stores that are, you could get a bagel in the middle of the night. Um, that's the, the beauty of growing up that way. Um, and that's what... Um, what resonates with the show? 
you know, I think we got to do a food of graves in. We got to come down to Brooklyn. Let's go to all the places. You know what I mean? We really got to dig in and highlight all of the, I mean, anybody who watches your show gets hungry. I know I do every time I watch it between the, the sandwiches and the pizza and the pasta that you guys are having. Uh, I mean, every Italian loves a show that features food and you guys do a great job at doing that. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. So I have to ask, um, speaking of restaurants and food, I've seen it in, um, I believe it was in Once Upon a Time in Brooklyn, and then you had another reference in Gravesend, but who messed with your food? Oh, did someone did spit really in your food you? at some point? Or uh, I know it, like a lot of restaurant people, but I just wonder if you wrote that in, um, and I think in Once Upon a Time, you had someone urinating. It was him. No, it was no, him. No, 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 that's oh, It was him. It was in wannabes. wannabes. Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank wannabes. you. Wannabes. Well, um, you know, thank God that never happened to me, but I had friends that worked in okay. kitchens and um i've heard stories i had a friend i've heard some kids crazy pissing his orange juice i've heard some crazy stories because you know some of my friends worked in, in restaurants and, and and been in the kitchens and, and sometimes like when they say you know always be nice to the waiters and waitresses mm -hmm. because remember they're handling your food and you don't know what they're doing back there so you never know but what, what the ironic part of that was is that i try to always think outside the box um, and try to figure out ways to like make things work. Um, and, and, and when I was, when I wrote that for, um, for Gravesend, the scene when, when um, he, he spit in Benny's burger, I was trying to figure out how Benny would find out. And then I, I remember it just came to me. And that's the beauty of when, of, of a writer is sometimes things just flow and they just, they just, come to you and, and i was like oh you know what benny's benny's gonna be in the bathroom and we, we humanized benny completely by ha him being on the toilet right yes sure. yes showing like a, you know guy, every we all do that and these guys sitting there and and it's it's it, it, and it's just it's hell of a just scene. so these guys come in and they're just talking stupid and like they just like they like would like they would yep like two waiters are just talking and they just happen to talk about what they did what he did to his burger and benny hears it and, and um, you know, bringing, we're talking about that. I just kind of felt like that that particular scene, the way everything played out, how Benny just, you know, tipped the guy. Yep. He gave him a hundred bucks, right? Yeah. 200 bucks or something yeah, like that. Because the guy was saying, you know, um, you know, the other guy said they're good tippers, yep. these wise guys. Benny tipped them really nice. And he well, kept his composure, complete, not to interrupt you, complete, but you got you went out to the car. To do, yeah. Virginia didn't even know. You're like, oh, honey, I left yeah. my beeper out exactly, there. Exactly. I mean, I, I mean, to me, I don't know, Lisa, would I have been a little hot? You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. You, you would have been breathing real heavy, <laughs> so, pan panting. I don't so know you if played I could have covered cool. it up. You played it so cool, and you went back. And you know what? The best part, the best part of that scene for me when you go back is the kid says, but we were in the same Little League team. And you said, oh, you bring that up now. <laughs> exactly, because, because the character... You know, he's staring down his girlfriend, you know, Virginia. Um, he's staring her down in a way. He's being a little disrespectful. Agreed. He never said, oh, yeah, Benny, oh, yo. He yeah, could have acknowledged nice you. to see you. So he kind of like, he got that character deserved what he got. Now, I've, I've, had, I've had people ask me. I've had, I've had two different um, opinions on the macaroni being poured on him. Okay, the like, gorilla. So, so that was completely improv. Okay. So, um... And some people have said I could have done without it, and some people said they loved it. When when you're acting um, and you're in the moment, that's a choice. People sure. got to understand because, like, a lot of times people like have this vision that they have their own thing, and like, there's no right or wrong. It was a choice, um, and I felt like that it was the last like f you like slap in the face to him that he poured the macaroni on him. So that's yes. why I chose to do that. Yeah, I, I think that was great. I, that's, that's how I would have done it myself. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, I, I kind of got like he was covered in Italian, whether he liked it or not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and there's a lot of that. You know, I want to kind of talk to you. You know, we probably watch the show more than most people, right? We probably like, uh, what did Armando Sante? A hundred fucking times. That's how many times we watch Gravesend because we love the show. In fact, we, this morning we finished Gotti for like the third time. We wanted to oh, catch up on that. That's brilliant. And speaking of that, I just want to, because you're on it. I want to just bring up another point to that, right? 
So Armand was so brilliant in that scene, and so was Gary Pastore. They were both like, oh, yes, they played it yes. so well, right? Yes. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching this, and I'm and I'm seeing Armand go off. Like that's when Armand's at his best when he's like, right on the edge, he's just like yeah, and he's just doing his thing. And and Gary was keeping up with him. He was doing his own thing. He was trying to like you know play him back, and, and it was great. And 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 when Armand Asante got up and he walked out, first take he walked. That was that that when he came back, that was not. That was not part of the script. So I'm sitting in the monitor and I'm watching this. And I'm watching these guys do this. And I, and I see cut, you know, my mom walks off. And I'm looking at it. I said, you know what? I go, I, I whispered in the mom's ear. I go, mom, next take. Go back. Go back to the table and go, I fucking do. Yes, so, I do. So, yeah. so what happened is, is like I said, a mom walks off. And I said, because the last line Gary says, if you think it's necessary. Yes. And then the scene breeds. So Gary Pastor's character, he plays Dominic. He says, "If you think it's necessary," and and the the way it was written, he just walks off. And I said, I, and I whispered in Amon's ear, "I said, come back into that scene and go, yeah, I fucking do." And then Amon comes in and he goes, "Yeah, I fucking do." And it was like brilliant, brilliant. And- he, Brilliant. That, Armand Asante, baby. You can't be Armand's delivery on any line in the show. I mean, especially, I want to talk about him and Fran, but let's go back to Gary for a second. Um, Gary, I was actually just speaking with Gary this morning about the scene, and I told him that I loved his posturing during it because he didn't back down, right? He had to show strength inside of that sit-down. He, he may have not been walk, walking out of that fucking meeting. You know what I mean? He didn't know if he was walking out or not. Yeah. And the fact when he did the hundred times, Gary just kind of leaned right in. And he had the cigarette. He just leaned right in. And he just he just took it. And I just thought it was really good acting and very authentic for a, a person in his position at that time. Exactly. What what well, Gary's from Brooklyn too. So Gary's this is no like Gary grew up in clubs and worked in a place called Pastels where all these guys came all the time. Oh no kidding. I didn't know that. Yeah, he's been around that his whole life, you know, growing up with the, he grew up in Brooklyn too. What what what, what Gary I love Gary has like great eyes on screen. Like he just his his the way his eyes are when he's in scenes, he just has this like, like I, I, and, and like his eyes were so like on Oman, like it was just, uh, it was powerful. All of them, yeah. everyone in that scene, um, you know. And then you know, you got my boy Steve Matarano, um, Baldi. you know, c- yeah, Cafe Matarano's my brother over there. Come on, you know, he's playing, you know, um, that's another one. That guy you know, cuts an imposing figure. Let me yeah. tell you something. Like Steve, Steve's. Never really acted. I took a chance with him because I knew that I knew he'd be fine. He has a great presence. He's uh, has a great look. He's a great person, um, and I knew that he'd be fine. You know, he's he hasn't acted before really much, but I knew that he would be. I've seen him speak um, on cooking shows and stuff like that, and I knew that he'd be fine. And um, I think he does a great job, and he and and him and Armand Asante together, and Tony Luke, uh, you know, who's another dear friend, you know, who's been in movies. He has a great movie that he did called The Nail, um, but and he's been in other movies as well. But I, I took prominent Philadelphia people, like Tony Luke's, um, has a you know his known his sandwiches name, all over. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and, and Steve Luke's. Matarano, who started in in Philadelphia, and I put them these prominent guys in the show together. Um, and we love the Philadelphia element of the show. We do too. And it was, it's fun for us as super fans, William, to discover this, right? Cause I didn't really know who Remo was until I dug into it. And then when I found out he was Tony Luke from Tony Luke's steak, I and mean, we go to Atlantic city all the time. You can't go to AC and not know about Tony Luke's. And then we heard his music and I, we were doing the little thing. Oh and then God. we heard lies and I was like, Holy cow. What an incredible voice. I mean, this guy's like Italian Luther Vandross. Uh, he acts and he's an incredible restaurant tour and business person. And you had the ability to put him in the show. And, and I mean, to me, this is some of the fun excitement about doing a show like the Talking Graves and podcast is just really discovering it. And we hope that we introduce some of these folks to you all who are watching the show who would maybe not have realized who that guy was wearing the Brooklyn brand shirt when, uh, when, when Nikki Sesta was yelling at him to get to Atlantic City. So there's something that I, I, a lot of people don't know um, about Tony Luke. And uh, I, I know that he'd be OK with me sharing this. Um, because he's he's put it out there, but that there's the song at the end of episode number two, 
when um, Sammy and uh, Sammy what Christian DeMeo, my son, plays the character of Sammy and uh, Mikey the Hat, Leo Rossi. They're talking by the um, in, in Miami about on, the fishing on the water, and it's very emotional. And um, they're talking about Sammy's talking about his mother, and uh, who is uh, Mikey's sister that he lost his mother. And if you remember, at the end of that episode, the song "One More One I More do. Night" comes on, and um. Tony Luke wrote that song for his son that passed away. His oh. son, his son passed away. I'm sorry to and, hear that. Wow. And, and he wrote the song about um, one more night, um, and it's uh, it's very touching, and the song is amazing. Wow. And um, uh, you know, Tony, uh, it was really um, I, I, he's so talented. Yes. And to have that song in the show, especially at that time in the show where we put it it was just um i always get choked up and i and I, I i i get choked up when i see that all the time i thought that that scene was so great and that song comes in and it just kind of really it's, it's hard to have any dry eyes when you see that and then he also had that other great song in the show called lies in the end of episode one yes oh that's um, a great tony's song. uh tony's all hot baby tony luke my brother Tony, thank you, and and William, thank you for being gracious to share that story about Tony. Um, it's hard for me not to get emotional when you hear that, and frankly, I know when we finished the episode, um, we both felt a bit emotional just with the music. It played such a, it, it added to the scene in such a way. And Sammy, is is he really has an intense discussion with Mikey the Hat that he hates his name because his name is the same as the killer of his mother Nancy. See, we watched the show, William, and, 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 and I just, I was really impressed with the duality that was present on screen, and quite frankly, we're going to talk to Christian about this when we get him on the show, how well of chemistry him and Leo Rossi, Michael the Hat, Oh, have. yeah, you believe that it's, it's really oh, uncle and nephew. You, you really know? do, and there's so much love in that scene. It was really good. Well, with that, you know, Leo Rossi's a, a, a veteran actor, and, um, I can't say, I mean, th this is what I'm saying. Like, you guys got me here, and I'm talking about people I love. Yeah. And I'm working with. So, I mean, a lot of people, and, and you know, I've I've done a lot of these, but, like, I'm really getting, you know, this is the one where people really want to know. You know, you got to tune in to watch this one. Like, uh, um, Leo Rossi is a, a great guy, and um, we work together. Um, in the Gotti movie, and you know we became really good friends, and he embraced my son, and he um he really sat down with my son, and, and that's another thing I have to say about my son is that I told him that you're gonna be people are going to want to see you fail because you're my son. Sure, people are gonna wanna they're gonna wanna say oh he got the part because of his father. That's what they're gonna they're gonna do. So I said, you have to be extra good good in this situation. I said, you you of all people are the are the number one target. Sure. That people are gonna look for to to knock. And I gotta tell you how proud I am of him because how many times I've been people will message me or talk to me and I'll run into people um strangers i'll be in a restaurant or something some people come up to me and say oh i love that show and they'll be like um, that, 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 who'd you pick the, the, the kid that played sammy they have no he's, idea it's your son he's, yeah he's so he's so good my like, that's my son <laughs> and, and you know you must have such pride at those moments yeah. it's, it's 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 the thing is is that um really i haven't gotten any I, I, and you know People have really said such so how, such great things about his performance, and um, he takes it very seriously. We can tell the he preparation. Doesn't, he doesn't just show up there, and that's what I have to say. I wanted to say this, you know, and I've said this before, but I will say it again: is that you got you got Christian DeMeo, my son, right? You have one person that's the director's and the creator's son who comes to set 
just early as anybody and, and just really just wants to perform and take it extremely seriously and, and, and go over the lines with, with the other people he's working with like crazy. And then you have Gabriella Palminteri, who plays Rosemary, legendary father, um, Jazz Palminteri, who's, you know, done some of the greatest movies and an amazing actor, um, very well known. And his daughter comes to set humble, not entitled, and just wants to do good. She and, and just, she was cast first, correct? Before you had casted her before before Chaz before Chaz. Yes, yes. But but let let's all I want you know, and I've said this before too, but I'll say it again: is that like she earned the part. Yeah. For anyone that thinks that she got the part because of a father, that that's I, I don't. She's great in this. She's great. The way she drives in her car when she's uh, going back to her father was just in jail, and she's going. I think she took she's right going to meet Ryan, Ryan. Right when she you. goes breaks up with him on the stoop. And, and she and your direction was great there. I mean, she's trying to feel like herself again in a place that she feels horrible, right? Because she's always been in those streets with immunity and 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 with like no problems. But now her dad's in jail. But she was just trying to be herself, and just I thought her acting came through great, and the chemistry that her and Christian both share. Is really good and thank it's very believable. Yeah, thank you. Well, the show comes first before um, any favors and things like that. So we auditioned people, and, and she was the best. She got the part, we, right? She was she was the best person we felt for the role. Uh, but the thing is, is like I said, is that she didn't come entitled. She came and did her job, and and, and you know that's that's kudos to her parents raising her right and her being the person that she is, that she just showed up as, as a novice person that just wanted to do well and, and did great. And, and so is Ralph Macho's daughter, Julia oh, Macho. Yeah. So then we, you know, we have, we have Julia Macho whose father is, you know, on the, the, one of the biggest shows right now, Cobra Kai. And she's also on that. And she comes there and she does it, you know, humble. And then we got Jesse Cove, who is a Martin Cove's son. Yes. Who's another one whose father is on the top show right Come now on. On, on Netflix? And here, yeah, okay, let me tell you about the Coves too. We're, we're going like the Coves. Martin Coves from Brooklyn, he's from Crown Heights. When he got the script, he's like, "This is my neighborhood. This is Brooklyn. I'm in. I like it. Nice. I'm in. I'm with you. We worked together in a movie, Bare Knuckle Brawler, together. We pay, We played um, like partners as cops, and I'd given them the script for Gravesend, and he was like, um. I love this. I'm, I'm from Crown Heights. And his son is another one who's so nice. Such a good guy. And he plays Eli in he the show. He plays Eli and he's really... So, William, I really want to know, you have a lot of beautiful shots in Gravesend, especially Gravesend 2. I believe your director of photography... Tell me if I'm saying his name right. George Mitas? George Midas. George and, Midas. And, and, and Angel Angel Barat. There's there's two. One did more with Florida. Okay. And which was Angel and George did Brooklyn. Okay, so Angel did Florida. So that was actually one of the shots I wanted to talk about. It was an establishing scene between you and the character Ronaldo, uh, who's played by Andrew Dice Clay. It's when you first went to meet him in Florida. And there you guys are color coordinated. You've got these beautiful leading line shots. Is that something that you wrote into the storyboard or is that something that you actually direct or is that your DP? Do you rely on him for those? It's a kind of a... Um both it's kind of like we both kind of like bounce bounce it off each other and um yeah but that 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 that, that that's cinematic scene yeah that's, beautiful that's, yeah, yeah it is yeah we we the, the, the thing about florida is is it opened up the show a lot and it uh it kind of brightened up the show um you know because we we're more darker when we we're in brooklyn and stuff like sure that. florida was like a little more of a brighter like miami like vice type thing the the opening shot was at Miami Nights was literally like a Miami Vice intro. You know, you had the the uh, Hobie Cat cut right across the screen, and I think it was uh, Clave Rocks was the song that you had yes, playing. Yes. Yeah, and uh, I'm already yeah. Oh, it was such a great scene. And then your character Benny Z is kind of going through. You know, like you know, um, you had your surgery. You're just healing. You know, you're just healing. Uh, I mean, just a really fun. Sorry, just a really fun shot. Um, 
And I, I was really curious about that. And the next thing is, which, since we brought up Clave Rocks, the music in Gravesend, William, is really what got me originally. I think I saw a reel on Facebook, and it had uh, some freestyle music in it. And, you know, growing up, a young Italian boy, we, we all listened to freestyle music. I mean, kids used to make fun of me. They said, why do you, why do you listen to these young Puerto Rican girl songs? And I'm like, because if you want to dance with pretty girls, you got to know these songs. You know what I mean? And I love that you used Giggles. Uh, and I don't know if you know this, but two weeks ago, Giggles, Giggles passed away. Um, wow, I did not know yes, that. Yes, she I'm did. She, yeah, that. she'd passed away. A friend of mine here in town, Bobby Coleman, who I actually recorded with, I wow. uh, was dear friend. She, Love Letters, in my opinion, is kind of like the iconic freestyle song, right? I mean, she's like the queen of freestyle. Yeah, Love Letter was great. Yeah, it, it just was like a perfect, for that moment when... when uh, Benny and Virginia were walking through Coney Island. Yeah. Ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. She was on a dream date. She had the bracelet. Or no, you gave her the bracelet yes. after that. Yeah. You know what I mean? But she yeah. had the guy. She had the bear. Yeah, she had the big teddy bear. I yeah. mean, yeah. come on. And then I like how respectful you showed the um, intimate moments uh, between Victoria and Benny. Where it was just the two trains crossing. And uh, the next scene cut to when you cut to was, was, was in the morning after. So a lot of respect inside of how you chose to portray. You know, a lot of people... They like dive into the nitty gritty of the sex and all of that stuff, but it really wasn't that uh, with the Victoria scene. So we really liked that. Virginia. Virginia, Virginia sorry. Virginia, yes. So when it comes to the music, um, I know that you've got a couple of folks. You, you rely on Mr. Bats. You rely on Ms. Ventno. How, how does that process work for you? Do you go there being like, listen, I want to have these songs? Um, did, I'm just curious how that, how that comes about in your show. Well, I have great people. Well, Chelsea Vento, she does the score. Uh, which she does a great job. Uh, she she uh, she'll always send me like a few different versions of of like her take on the score and the tempo and stuff like that. And um, she does a really good job. So um, we we usually get it within a couple of times. Like I'll just give a little note here and there. Um, J Joey Bats and Peter Prester are two of um, people that are very connected um, with and with record labels and stuff like that. And uh, for me, um, music has been important my whole life. And, uh, you know, most of those songs I picked out, like okay. uh, like like the, the actual um, songs for the show. Uh, and then, you know, Frankie Valli, uh, who's going to be in season three, um, we met him and we loved him. Wow. And uh, you had somebody playing Frankie Valley on the show because he came and sang at your welcome home party that yeah. uh, Santo threw you, Bodito. Yeah, yeah. So um, he, he, we, we had to have Frankie Valley music in the show. Yes. And uh, so when you do that, for people that want to know about like how you put a soundtrack together, is is that you know you 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 go you 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 have to pay for these songs obviously and uh you try to work out the best deal you could possibly get so sometimes you'll have like two or three ideas and you'll try to see which one i'll tell you certain songs that were 100 percent had to be okay 100 percent had to be um the uh seasons change went the By song expose yeah yeah yep. when uh sammy and uh and rosemary are on the beach I said this song has got to be yes. in the show. Like that song has to it has sometimes you'll test the song, you'll play it and you'll see how it goes. But people don't know this and um and you guys touched on it. Is the Cats in the Cradle originally originally we we had the Candy Man playing by um uh Sammy Davis. Okay. The Candy Man can. Yeah. Yep. And um we had the song playing and when we went to get the rights to it, we were having issues with um, the Mars, like the Mars group, the Mars bar was like involved in it. And they were like giving us some issues with it. They're like, you know, we have to see the scene and this and that. And, and um, uh, we were thinking about what else to put there. And I was thinking of a few different um, songs. And then it, it dawned on me. Mm. He said, the cat's in the cradle. And, and we played it before we got the rights to it and it was like it fit this is, has to be and I'll tell you another one um which a lot of people didn't know this song and um one day I'm um I uh I, I, I own some like classic cars I, a lot of the cars in the show I own and um I was driving in my um 78 
the Buick, the, the car that... Um, the 75th anniversary two-tone Buick yeah, Riviera. You know, you know your cars, the Buick Riviera. I, I had... Uh, um, someone sent me like um, a, a whole case of like eight tracks. A friend of mine said, "You know, I you know I can't use these," and they sent me and and, and one day I'm just popping the because I had an eight track player. Okay, right? I didn't change the stereo. I like my cars to be original for the most part. And I'm listening to this this eight track of, of um, Neil Diamond, and I know a lot of Neil Diamond songs. And Neil Diamond's from Brooklyn, and the song Brooklyn Roads comes on, and I'm like. Wow, I don't know. I never heard this song. Yeah, and I'm like, wow, this is this is this this sums up the show. This is the ending of the show, Brooklyn Roads, because it's Brooklyn Roads, and um, that was another must. And I can't tell you how many people have told me and said they love that song there, and how um, the song has um, they didn't know it, and, okay. uh, and 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 it really it really. It was great. It was great. I thought that that was like such a great song to play, our our ending of of the of the final piece of episode nine, like the ending scene, uh, how it ends. So that was another song that was like a must. The cats in the cradle song would hundred percent emotionally touched me. Um, without going into it, it reminds me and mirrors my life very similar. Um, relationships with my father and not having time to be together at all. And uh, I sang that song to myself as a child to f- make myself feel better at times. And uh, quite frankly, um, Lisa and I watched that episode separately, and she actually came home from the gym after watching it. She goes, I know why you've been upset for five days, because that show reminds you of your father and everything that you're going through. And, and literally and truly, it, it moved me. It moved me. So it was worth every dollar that you yeah, paid for the rights. Well, that was during the, um, when you and Tommaso had the, the conversations about your father Absolutely. sitting outside. And yeah, then it closed yeah, with I, that. And I, I, I felt like the song, and that's another thing that people don't know, is that when Louis Lombardi and I were sitting in front of that um, cafe, which is on Avenue U, which is right where I grew up, and we started talking, we started doing the scene, um, it wasn't necessarily, it was, we were talking about, but like, he got really emotional yeah. speaking about it. And yeah. then he kind of like started to like get teary eyed. And then, and then it just like, like he's such a good actor that like it, it really brought Benny to another place. And I, and, and I, um, I had mixed feelings about Benny's a strong character and he's a strong guy. And, um, you know, there are people that'll say that, um, you know, a guy like that, we should never see tears come from him. I don't believe that. And yeah, I, I agree. I don't believe Cause that. Because I, I was torn for a minute, and I was like, you know... I've seen real his, men This cry. is his... Yeah, we have. But he's with his friend, who was like a, a boy, like like his boy. So, and they're boys, so he can get emotional in front of him. And I felt like it worked. Yes, I felt like Benny is like it's. We got to see some vulnerability to him, um, which every person has vulnerability, and uh, it felt like that um, it humanized him even more. Uh, that he was very upset about um, thinking about his father. I liked how Tommaso uh, said, "Don't give up." You know, you told him that you you called your dad and he and he hung up on you. And, and it, it's, you know, part of this Catholic guilt that we all grow up with, no matter what our parents may or may not have done to us, we're still going to do what we can to make amends with them. So I really thought that was really true to life. And, uh, and when you switch to the black and white and we go into the cats in the cradle and you see how close you and your son are, uh, you and your father are rather, and he gets you the toasted almond ice cream. Because I know where we're getting toasted almond for you. And then he buys everyone in the neighborhood ice cream and of course the scene opened up the the show opened up with you back in Brooklyn at the black party buying everybody ice cream so I really get that Benny is a sensitive person he's two people in my opinion you can correct me this is Benny right sitting me right next to the guy who wrote his character but for me uh, when I watch him I identify with him as he's two people right he's his father and he's Charlie Um, I have a very similar experience in my life and and I absolutely identify with that character and the fact that Benny's we want to touch upon why Benny doesn't like to drink 
but the fact that he self-medicates with alcohol every time he puts in work shows me that there is, in fact, a soft center to that individual. He's not just this hard man. He has heart and cares about people and his community. And I think you do a good job at sh showing both in a very conservative way. Thank you. Yeah, well, well that's the thing is, is, you know, he has this one person, um, you know, Charlie, who's, uh, who's uh, you know, bigger than life, you know, that was kind of like what when he's a kid and he sees this guy get out of the car, his cousin, and shut down the whole neighborhood. The whole neighborhood was yeah. like an awe. You know, Chris Tardio has such great screen presence. I knew when I was casting that role, it was Chris Tardio all along. No one, there was no that one was, else. No that doubt. Was be it. There was no one else. There's no one else but Chris Tardio for that part. Because Chris Tardio is my friend. We've worked together before and analyzed that and other things. And um, I knew that he he was the guy. Because he just has such great screen presence and just the way he is. And, and um, uh, you know, th Benny as a kid witnesses this. And he's like, you know, any anyone would be in awe. But, you know, his father has, has this whole other side to him sure. that's like, uh, you know, hardworking man and very honorable um, Italian-American. Uh, and he, you know, he's... He, but. It, it, he he went down the path, and and there's no turning back. That's the whole thing. It, like, yeah, that's what it is. Is the opening of the scene. I I set it up where people would know when Benny's talking to Saint Anthony because that's kind of almost in a way where he kind of vents sometimes sure. and he talks to Saint Anthony because he's kind of if you see he's like he he's he feels the guilt sometimes. Um, you know, and it's hard for him to look at the Lord. Um, at the cross and stuff like that. And he just kind of, kind of like St. Anthony's his go-between. And, uh... Because you, you can't, know, Benny can't talk to God direct. He's got to talk to St. Anthony, right? Well, I mean, I feel like that a lot of times he's, he's he feels a little bit almost like he's maybe ashamed to talk to God because, you know, he's putting people in boxes sometimes. Yeah. But he tries to justify it when he speaks to St. Anthony. And, and But I set it up in the beginning that... that And that's why sometimes, like, when, when we were going through this and um, in the very beginning, uh, you know, I wanted him to... When he's talking to St. Anthony, he says that, um, you know, I go in full force. Whatever I do is full force. That's it. You're in, you're in. And... When Benny killed uh, um, the character Dominic in the garage, yes. When we were going through that, and I was having some like talking to other writers and stuff, like sometimes people said maybe it happened too quick. I wanted it to be like I wanted people to know right in the beginning. Don't this, this is, is where it's break, at. You right? break the rule. Yeah, you no do matter who you are, you put this guy's life at risk, and that's it. And you know, as much as Dominic was who's played by another good actor, very good actor, and a good guy, um, Pauli Malnagy, another guy from Brooklyn. Malnagy? Great, great boxer. Yeah, Pauli Malnagy's a boxer. He was great. And um, he, he he put Benny in a very bad situation, and, and um, there was no way around that. Yeah. He had to go. That's and one of the uh, things about the character in the story is that your character is constantly put into situations through people that are under him or above him. It's like you have no control. You get about 15 minutes of relaxation, and then the next problem arises from whoever it is that did something because, that you have to but, deal with. Because if you really look and you know about this world, this is what happens with these guys. These guys are always taking care of problems for other people. And you know what? what's crazy about it? And if you could look at the history and, and, and stuff of what goes on in the real world, in that real world, a lot of times these guys, these, these high-ranking guys, they go to jail for, like, the lowest of the, the, the people who are on the bottom of the barrel that, like, get in trouble for drugs or something, and they never even had a conversation with these guys or hearsay. But they get arrested and they they all target the main guys. So these guys, you know, they talk and they they, they don't they lie even half the times and, and like the the bigger guy goes to prison. So um I'm trying to like show how careful Benny's trying to be with who he speaks to and that's why those characters um 
uh, Robert and um, Nino. Robert tell, and Nino, Sammy's Ro- crew. Robert and Nino tell uh, Sammy, you know, wow, Benny spoke too direct. Direct. Because Benny's like, careful. That's why when, um, I know you love the, the, the Sauce vs. Gravy um, episode. Is you know Benny's um walking into the restaurant, walking out of the restaurant with uh, Mario Cantone's character Franco, and these 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 guys roll up and they're like, uh, you know, we're from Avenue P, uh, you know, friends with Johnny Mad Dog, uh, you 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 know them. Yeah, like, they were dropping names. You yeah, don't talk to people yeah, that yeah, you don't. You know. don't you don't like, you don't. And another thing is like people that like. No, people don't even say they know. They, you don't. They don't. That's right. The name droppers don't know anybody most of the time. For most of the time, they just like have to say those names. But that's a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like the fact that you're showing things the way they go down. I mean, really, I don't think there's another program. If I might just give you that compliment, that gets the rules right. Um, really, the posturing. Benny's character, when he sits down with Maddie Cigars for that very first conversation that we were talking about with Dominic that brought the whole thing up, he, like, insults you right off the rip almost, and you just have to sit there and take it. I like how you swallow. You, know, you swallow. You, you, you're, like, you're dealing with what he has to say, but you, you're, like, you thank him for the audience, and you know what you have to do. And I like how we, but later in the scene, they're like, well, you know, that thing that happened with uh, Dominic was a real mess, but you handled yourself right, which means you fucking killed the kid, like, right away. So, I mean, it was unbelievable writing. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, well, Paul Van Victor is a great actor to oh, act across. Yeah, The guy's brilliant. So he, he just, you know. That scene with him when, 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 when Chris Telva went to see him and oh they had goodness. that moment, my goodness. Grabs his hand. Yeah, that was a really And he really took his hand, and scene. not to touch you, but I can touch people. I'm Italian. He took his hand in friendship at the end. I'll never, like, so, so he had the exchange, and then he got up, and then he took Chris's hand in friendship, and I'll never forget the way that that scene was as the man cried and said, we're good, we're good here, but, Chris. But, because in all reality there, if you really, th- like, well, let's, let's, let's really slice that up and see. So, you know, you got this, the kid is not, a made guy, the, the, the kid that did what he did. Um, Benny's a made guy. The other guy's a captain above him in a different family. Um, Benny took care of what, you know, I know it was his son, and the guy killed his son. It's not like Benny sent the guy to do it. No, the guy no. did it, and Benny right, He did it him. on his own. So some yeah. people are always like, oh, he wouldn't. No, I mean, the, the, the you guy. You were responsible the, the, for the, that. The, yeah, the guy understood that as Benny, Bad a situation it was, he really had to let it go. As, and, and that's what was so great about the way Paul Ben Victor played that because yes. he was like, he, but he, he just, as much as he probably wanted to kill Benny, but he, he really knew in his back of his head it really wasn't Benny's fault. Yeah. And I think that maybe, I think, you know, I know, I'm the writer, is, is that he wishes he killed him himself before that. That maybe he didn't okay. give the kid a pass. He just clipped the kid because if he would have did it, it even though he was with Benny, even even though he was with Benny, he's the kid isn't a made guy, and he could have did it. So not like he was he wasn't made Dominic, so he could have killed Dominic technically. So I think part of his his anger is that he didn't do that. And that he just gave him the pass and that gave was, him the pass. Yep. For putting wow. Him. Uh, this is why I want to have you on the show, William. I never considered that. <laughs> Come on. Did you consider that when you watched that episode? Paul Ben Victor inside of that scene, amazing. You rocked that scene without question. It like gripped me. Um, outstanding acting and outstanding direction inside of that. Thank you. I think it was a great location, too. It's unfortunate that restaurant closed, but that was an, a, a great location um, that we shot. It's supposed to be Arthur Avenue. The exterior is Arthur Avenue, but the interior was a restaurant in Brooklyn. Okay. They're closed down on Avenue U. Yeah, you've got a lot of locations. I know John's Bar was one of your favorite spots. Um, that was uh, in the show. I think it's right in the intro, if I'm not mistaken. Joe's Bar. Joe's Bar. Joe's Bar, right? That's where episode two well, Joe, opens Joe's, up. Joe's Bar is on Avenue U, too. That's the thing is, is that I love the fact that we, have so, we still have so many great places that we could shoot at and that still have that old school vibe inside. Um, it's great. Uh, great. Great stuff. It's great to shoot. Right in the neighborhood. So I got to ask you, a couple of uh, guys, Gino and Vinny, you put them on the shelf after they screwed up at the inside of the bar, outside of the restaurant. Are they going to come back in season three? Um, I, I'm, 
I don't really want to um this this um yeah, that's fine. divulge what's going okay. on in season We're three. We're pressing them, but we can't get them to we can't get them to <laughs> cough up any leaks here. We're doing our best, trust me. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't want to give too much away for season three. You know, it's funny. Um, we have some bizarre connections with your cast that we've never really divulged to you. Um, third day after we released our show, I received a direct private message from Armand Asante. We had a very nice conversation. And here's the best part about it. He was at my house when I was three years old with an invitation from my mother. He had dinner at my house. He played in 1976. Or I'm, I'm three, so 1975, uh, he played Brick in Fiddle Around the Roof, Tennessee Williams, right across the river here at Stage West. My aunt was the manager of uh, Stage West. Did he know this? Did he, he, say- he knew this. We had a long conversation. He remembers my mother. My mother had him over for dinner. I was a little boy. He, uh, My mom put, this is when he was, he, now Tennessee Williams wrote, rewrote uh, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof and wrote Amanda Sante into that role as Brick. And he came and played it. And Tennessee William himself was here for opening night. Wow. I got to tell you about Amanda Sante, too, man. What a great man that guy is. Let me tell you, like, and just to, I'm so blessed that I could be with these guys. And, and like, we have a personal relationship that is so strong. Um, and that's why I feel like God is part of this, because yeah. it brought so many people together. Um, and as a, you know, a younger filmmaker and actor, you know, we, he played my father in Once Upon a Time in Brooklyn. And, uh, that man has so much charisma. And I'll tell you, my mom, she was like, I, I have to meet Amanda Sante. Yeah. He's like gorgeous. Like, it's, <laughs> it's so funny because that man, like all the women wanted Amanda Sante. Like he had, they, so many women were like, was so, um, enamored by Amon Asante's mannerisms and his looks and everything. And, he, and, he, and he's still that guy. He's still, he hasn't lost a step, you know. Um, he's, still, he's still in good shape. Um, he's, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so blessed and I'm, and I'm, I'm excited to, to, to work with him soon in season three. Um, I, we have some real good stuff we're going to do. I just want you to know how complimentary and how humble he was when he contacted us. And I knew it was him. I thought, you know, maybe it's his publicist. Maybe it's his manager. But as he began to share his thoughts and I brought up my mom and and everything, he was so graceful. And so generous with his words. Thank you, Lisa. So generous with his words. Uh, It literally made our month. You know, because as creators, I'm sure you could feel like this. You know, we we took a chance in doing this show. We're putting ourselves out there in a way. And to have a man like Armand Asante send you a direct message in the morning and just list all of the wonderful things. I mean, he he said some things that touched me. You know, he's like, you know, what you're doing by uplifting everyone in the show doesn't, uh, isn't falling um, on deaf ears with me. I'm. He was humbly impressed with what we were up to. And I just, I was so thankful to receive something like that. Well, that's Armand Asante for you. That, that's the type of person that he is, you know, um, that, that's what it is. And that's why I say how much I, I appreciate that man, because he's, he's a very good person and he noticed what you guys did and he reached out. I mean, we're all human, right? No matter, no matter where Absolutely. you are, we're all, we're all doing something, right? We're all the same. We're just living our lives a certain way. And, um, we, we have to. That's what I said. Like I noticed what you guys were doing too, and it was it was very um, I, I was very um, impressed, and, and and like I said, I'm honored to be here, and honored that you guys uh, did this what, what um, did this for us. Um, Thank and, you. And a part of Gravesend and going forward, uh, you know, like I said, all these these cast members, um, they're all you know Chuck Zito and and. Uh, Great guy. I mean, and, and to see Chuck Zito fighting in, in a scene, you know, a guy who's so tough on the streets. and, and what, a, what a fight how scene. How he clubbed those two guys with one punch. With one yeah. punch. Oh, that's real. The, oh, you know, I, Chuck, I bet. I Ch- bet. Chuck is, Chuck is uh, another guy who's in great shape and still still the man. Um, still, and I'm so He's like happy. a martial arts expert. Oh, He's a yeah. boxing expert. He was oh. a Hells Angels guy. I mean, this is not somebody you want to mouth off to. No, no. <laughs> Chuck, Chuck. Chuck, but here's the thing that people don't know. Chuck's Chuck's good, man. He's he's good. Just just you know, just be do do right. 
he's he's a good guy and he's a, a really good actor and Vinny Pastore um you know another guy who I've worked with numerous times who is another you know, what a good man uh, a, a good actor uh all these guys I, I'm I'm like so blessed to to have a cast like this and to work you know Paul Bugazi who directed me in other movies like Paul. we said playing playing um Agent Morano uh you know, and, and, and Fran Drescher, who, I'll tell, let me tell you, here's something you want to know that people don't know about Fran Drescher, right? So I'll give you a, a little, um, no one's, as um, I've never said this on Ooh. in a podcast yet. That woman came hair and makeup ready. Like, when you're, when you have a woman in a scene, and uh, you know, you have to, main, a woman wants to look a certain way, and, you know, is fussy, obviously. This woman came, she goes, I'm done. I'm in my wardrobe. Call me when you need me. Nice. Like, boom. She shows up on set, ready to work. Ready to work. That's that fabulous. That is so rare. Yeah. And 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 that's another one who's humble. The the the, the president of our union, uh, who like her delivery. Like when she was doing the scenes with Gary Pastore's character and she was like everything about Fran Drescher, like when I'm sitting there directing and I'm like, you know why she's a star. Yeah. Like, you know, you know, when stars walk in the room, you, you just, you just know it. There's something about them. Like, like when I met John Travolta, I knew he was a star. Like you, 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 you feel see, that presence. You, yeah. It's like, just like when I first met him and talked to him, I said, now I know why this guy has been like in some of the biggest movies ever. Sure. Like what, just the, just the way he carries himself. And you get that with Fran Drescher. You know, that's why she's a household name. Oh, yeah. And she really steals some of those scenes. I mean, phenomenal. when when she's harassing the guys as they're trying to eat their lunch and she just steps to them and she she takes that power stance as she's talking. I love I love her character. Absolutely. I, she Thank really you. riles Thank them. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And her and Amand work great together. The two of them together. <gasps> they're you, so believable. It's so good as, as sister and brother because she speaks to him in such a way and he allows her to speak. And it's it's really something yeah. to watch. And, and then you got Sophia Milos, right? You got this beautiful <sighs> woman. Who um who everyone remembered from The Sopranos in Italy, and been in a lot of movies. Law and uh, Order. Yeah, I mean, well, she's so much work. CSI Miami, and uh, she's just so good. I think she, she's going to be your biggest threat. I think for oh, Benny. Come on, you got to watch yeah. out for Tina Telva. Can we talk about this for one second, mm -mm -mm. William? Uh, let's let's look at. I, there's a lot of scary guys in your show, okay? But I think the scariest person for your character is Tina Telva. Yes, the way she positions she's, and does her hair before she beeps you. She's the most dangerous character mm -mm. that you've got to contend with. I honestly believe that she's got it bad for Benny. You can and maybe tell. it's because I grew up with an Italian mother who would like break a wooden well, spoon the, over my the, ass. The, the, you know what the, I mean? Because you don't want to mess with these the, people. The, the thing is, is that, you know, the character in the situation is, like, people, like, she's vulnerable, right? And um, it's realistic. Sure. You know, it's For dangerous. Sure. Her it, husband, it's it's yeah. completely dangerous, but it's realistic, and it's happened, and it's, it's, it's it, in real life, things of like that have happened in the streets, and, and you know, people have, you know, have... have have actually acted upon it in, in, in situations and stuff like that. And it was hard for Benny because, you know, you know, the way she looks and, and, and the way what she was doing, but you know, that's not, you know, that wasn't Benny wasn't going to do that. No. Penalties. Benny was about loyalty and, um, that's his captain. And, um, but she was, the way she played it was just so, you know, just her lines, the deliveries, and everything like that. How she, uh, uh, that's another thing you guys have no idea what's gonna happen. <laughs> I can only imagine. I mean, oh I wondered when no, she you guys have no idea like what's gonna happen with that. Like, we that's going to a place that's just like, oh you, man, you're not gonna be a, like, this another one. Don't even try and figure it out. This is not <laughs> well, I was happy you brought Big Rocco the last time you met with her because that makes yeah, it a little thank safer. God. So, yeah. No, uh, she's she's a great character, um, a great actress, and for, like I said, she scares me a little bit. I'm a little frightened of her, um, and and really, 
she understands what she's doing, I think, in a lot of ways. And uh, the, your character just handles it so well. The fact that he refuses to meet with her behind closed doors without somebody, I mean, that's it's absolutely it's true to the rules. And I just love what happens. I can't wait to find out what happens with, uh, with Rosemary. She's, she speaks like th- seven languages. She has like three passports. Yeah, Tina, yes. I mean, yes, she's yes, just yes. unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. With uh, Sophia Milos is... Uh, She's great too. She's 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 very prepared and and uh, very dedicated. Uh, she's 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 we're, we're thrilled to have her in our cast. I'm honored to to have her being part of Gravesend. She's she's wonderful. You know that's one of the things about it, and we've talked to touch about it a little bit on this podcast. Is that you have so many great characters. If you've watched The Sopranos, if you've watched any organized crime programming in the past twenty years, you've probably got those people on your show. You've got people you already love, you know. And then you go back. You have Martin Cove. This is just a fun show to watch. If you haven't watched Gravesend series on Amazon Prime and Tubi, you've got to go out and do it right now. This is the man right here. This is the man who created the show. And to have him here inside of our Talking Gravesend podcast, you have no idea what an honor it is to be here with you, William. Well, I'm honored to be here, like I said. And uh, we could keep talking, but we're, I know what we have to, to wrap it up. But like I said, really, really grateful that you guys took it upon yourselves. And it just goes to show people out there that when you... When you have a vision and 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 you want to do something, just go for it. And, and uh, you know, it, it, we we noticed it, and we're we're grateful for it. I Thank want you. you to know that you know this setup here and everything you're doing here. Um, any new people that come to our show through you guys is, is is it's amazing, and the sky's the limit here. So this is just you know one of many, and you'll you'll have all my cast members on here at one point. Hey, that sounds good. Lisa. Yeah, and there's a lot of new ones that are coming in season three that are going to be uh, some really great new people coming, and 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 the people that are already there, well, we're gonna have a lot of fun. William, we've had a lot of fun with you today. This has been so fantastic. I mean, we love Gravesend. We love you. We love your character, your writing, your direction, the music, the cars, the location. There's nothing about this show. Like you said earlier, you're going to laugh. You're going to cry. Uh, it has everything that you're looking for in a program. So, you know, if you're looking for a new show to watch, come on, you got to get up on Gravesend. And while you're doing that, make sure you go ahead and follow the Gravesend series or on Instagram and in Facebook. We'll put all the information right here. And while you're busy liking people on social media, don't forget to go ahead and like us on Facebook and Instagram with the Talking Gravesend podcast. Subscribe on YouTube. Uh, is there anything else I missed there, Lisa? No, I think that's it. We're on the audio podcast. Oh, just... that's right. Have you ever listened to? Have you ever listened to the audio podcast? Yeah, you don't, you don't just see us visually. We're audio only. It's as almost well. a different experience, William. You know, that's, popping I, in and then I, I have to I have to try that. Uh, uh, there's just two things that what I just wanted to say. One about my eyes adored you. Yes, with Frankie oh. Valley yes. playing and everyone dancing in the street. My mother was actually in that scene dancing with us. Um, and my uncle, my uncle Billy, and a lot of my neighborhood was in that scene. That was really special. It was great to see the neighborhood come out because I, I, when I was a kid, the block parties, people would dance in the street. I'd see the old the, the songs, the love songs playing, and the couples dancing. And I'd look and I'd see and then dancing in the street and the Tarantella. It was great. And I and I and I I want to say that um, if you don't follow. Um, if you haven't had a chance to follow or know about the Talking Graves End podcast, these two, Lisa to my left and Chris to my right, they do a, a great job. They speak so well. They Their detail to everything is so well thought out. You could see that they take time. They don't just show up here and just slap it up there. They're very detailed oriented. They've noticed things in the show that a lot of people haven't. They've they really know what they're talking about, and uh, that's why we're honored. And if you don't know about the Talking Graves and podcast guys, and if you're a fan of Graves and you have to follow these guys, they're 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 they're, they're excellent and they're they're really good people. Um, and I think you should. You'll, you'll learn a lot of things that you may not know about Gravesend if you watch their podcast uh, and continue to watch them. Um, and we're we're honored and grateful that they'll be part of season three and be on our set. And there's a lot of great things to come. And um, thank you again. And God bless everybody. And, um, you know, thank you and to all you fans yes. and people that have helped us get to season two, all you people that have told 
your friends and family members about this show. Thank you so much. Really, from my heart, I can't tell you how much, how grateful I am to every single one of you people that has supported us and has hit, liked us on social media and spread the word and, and some of your wonderful comments and, and some of you guys that take time out to write great reviews about our show. We're really grateful. Um, you know, we're, we're very humble and, and appreciative of all of you. Thank you so much, and may God bless you all, and thank you, and uh, the best is yet to come here. God bless. I couldn't have said it any better myself. I can't wait for season three. All I'm right. all in. On behalf of William DeMeo, West Street Productions, all of us here at Talking Graves and Podcasts in Springfield, Massachusetts, you know how we uh, take them out, Lisa, where are we going to see them? We'll see you on the streets. And Brooklyn brand, baby. Yeah. Brooklyn brand. Brooklyn brand, Velour Sweatsuits, Brooklyn brand shirts, and, and all of that. We're repping. A double B right here. Brooklyn Brand's in the house. I can't wait to get mine. <laughs>